Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Glad you're here. Glad that we can be together in the house of the Lord. We can encourage each other. We can join in worship. Welcome all who are watching on Facebook Live and other means. A few announcements before we get going. We're always glad for the uh, for the youth activities we have going on here and encourage you to take note of all the slides with that. I want to skip ahead to tonight's meeting of the Glory of God South Shore that is uh, meets this this time around at the Kingston uh, Vineyard Church. And that, uh, what's, what you got for time on that? 6 p.m.? I should be in there somewhere. There you go, 6 p.m. And so that, that's going on there. That, what that is is a chance to pray together for the needs of the world and for right here, for revival, but also for uh, God's justice and kingdom to expand. And so it's a great time together, time to, to uh, break down any dividing walls between uh, different churches or whatever and just be Christians together. So that's a good time. I um, want to look at, at Holy Week. You should have a nice little uh, half sheet insert in there. Lots of stuff going on. Uh, add an E to the end of Tenebrae just so that I don't kind of get the shivers. It, it, should, it should have an E on there. Um, but uh, one of the important things going on there is Thursday night from 5 to 8 p.m., our Seder service. And I wanted to give Bob Houston the time to come on back up and talk some more about it. So, Bob, uh, give us some more information on it. And, folks, I just want to encourage you to uh, be giving a sign-up uh, today for that. Uh, Dimitri will be at the table at the front of the coffee hour line, um, not snitching, but rather uh, taking your, uh, your names and uh, getting a, a good count preparation. Bob, talk to us about the, about the Seder. What is the Seder all about? All right. The interesting thing is this is a moed, okay? It's a time, okay, to rehearse. And if you come to the Seder, it won't save you. But if you went to the Seder, you would have been saved. Now, that's confusing, isn't it? Ah. I see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> you know... Because the Seder is a remembrance of history. Now, how many of you realize, okay, people are trying to eliminate history? Well, this is something that happened, okay, back there in the third century, okay, with Constantine. He tried to eliminate history. And by eliminating history, he didn't want anyone to know about the Jewish feast. Now, if a Jewish feast is a celebration of the presence of God. How many of you would like to be there? <laughs> I see a few hands in the congregation. You know, because you know, we are a part of the family of God. Right? We have been grafted in, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, that we have been grafted into the household of God. And how many know that the father of the household of God, okay, other than being God, the next step down was Abraham. And we have been grafted into Abraham, into the Jewish roots. And so we should celebrate, okay, what God has for us, okay? He set these up for an appointment for all times. Now, when the Hebrew people came out of Egypt, who came out? Just the Hebrews? No, the Gentiles came out. Now, we, how many of you know, the, know, have heard about Joseph? Anyone heard about Joseph? Now, he was a Hebrew, okay? He walked with Moses. He was Moses' aides. There was another one. His name is Caleb. Jo you meant Joshua. Oh, I meant Joshua. Yeah. Well, I get confused, okay. you know? There's too much in the book. I can't remember it all. Come to the Savior, you'll get it. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> right? But there was also another that came out. It was Caleb. Right? Caleb wasn't Hebrew. He was a Gentile. Hmm. So we have Jew and Gentile together. Now, the unique thing about that is when Paul went out on his missionary journey, the first place he stopped in any city was where? Where? Synagogue. Why on earth would he go to the synagogue, okay? Because, you know, didn't Jesus start a new religion? 
No, he completed the old religion. Right? That's the unique thing, okay? We need to see the Hebrew roots, okay, of what God designed and how we come to worship him. And when we come to the Seder, you'll see Jesus, Yeshua, reflected all through the Seder service. And so the invitation is to you. The sign-up sheet is out back. So sign up. Come, okay, because this is going to be a learning experience, and as part of learning, as the church works on its stomach, okay, we're going to serve food also. <laughs> Great. Bob, thanks very much. <laughs> right. And if you're online and you'd like to, to sign, if you're watching us, uh, just call the church, 781-293-7997, uh, and just let us know, and we'll count on it. I think we're figuring on $10 a head for the cost of the food and such, and then uh, bring an extra buck, and you'll find out why. But uh, that, that's going on. Um, you've got some inserts about Easter flowers. Everybody loves the association with that. Oh, before you lose that slide, notice that the name Marcolino is slightly misspelled on this slide. Um, <laughs> I told, Cheryl asked me who was preaching, and I said, Sarah. And, well, Sarah Wilson is the, is the pastor of the Bryanville Church who pre preached last year. So she said, oh, I don't have to change a thing. Oh, I said, Assumptions, right? But, uh, so that's, that's also going on, the sunrise service at 6 a.m. You can get breakfast right next door because it's at the old uh, Monponset Inn. The, was it Lakeside Tavern, restaurant, whatever now? Whatever. So, uh, so right, right on there on, on 58 as you go south toward Halifax. So uh, 6 a.m., it's a late Easter this year, April 17th, so sunrise might even have happened by the time we get there, but I, I couldn't begin to write a five at the start of that. So 6 o'clock for that. Um, now let's go ahead. I think you've got all oh, that. Huh, okay, there we go. There we go. We're, we have this fine-tuned. Uh, so... Your chance to get the pictures and uh, to get the flowers. And Sam, are, are you kind of running this? Do they see you about these? Or who, who, you and who? Um, <laughs> I can either, uh, I can help sign up for that or they can just fill that out and put it right in the... Uh, oh, in the offering plate or... The offering plate. Sure. You can make a pile next to what Demetra's doing too. That You can just make, if they can do, you can make a pile. <laughs> And, and they'll charge you an extra $10, and you'll have a meal on Thursday night, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, somebody that we can be doing something special for are the, the sailors get serviced by Seafarer's Friend. The, uh, your Lenten boxes this year, use your extra change as it goes through the, uh, as you go through the, the days of Lent, and, uh, and make that a little offering that we can do to, uh, to be a blessing to the... Um, to the, to the crews of these many, many freight ships. You know, something like 90% of all goods are on freight ships at some point or another. So um, there's actually quite a lot of people that, that a seafarer's friend serves in Christ's name. So that's a good thing to be supporting. I also just want to look ahead to Tuesday. I've got a little bit of a scheduling issue going on. We have a new members class scheduled for 6 o'clock, and we've got a small group leaders class scheduled for 7. I'm not really good at being in two places at once, but I like to try sometimes. But if you're, in, if you're interested in coming to the small group, uh, sorry, to the new members class at 6 p.m., would you please see me after the service? And we'll make sure that we get everything coordinated on that. So if you're interested in new members class, 6 p.m. on Tuesday, please see me right after service. Those are our announcements, and I uh, invite us now to enter into the presence of God, to worship him, and to join with our worship team as they lead us in singing. We've got two beautiful songs today, both of them speak a lot of truth about God, but we, it's, they're addressed to him personally. We're talking to him. So um, I hope you really listen to these words as you sing them. Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change, this one thing
it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love and on and on and on and on it goes yes it overwhelms and satisfies my soul and I'll never ever have to be afraid Cause this one thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up it never runs out on me, your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the
I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right, right hand, hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does happen. I, I shall, shall not die, but, but I, I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Thank you all. As we pray, I do want to pass on the, uh, the prayers uh, and thanks, rather, of the uh, family of Edna Howland. You know, it's, all, it's a great and joyful thing to recount the goodness of the Lord as we see it in the life of somebody as wonderful as Edna was. And we really had that experience yesterday. And I think Christians might just be alone among those who can go to a funeral and say, that was a blessing. Because Edna lived her pilgrimage joyfully, openly, generously, and um, her works follow her. And it was a beautiful time. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that when we gather in your name, you are among us. We thank you that in you there is a life that cannot be taken away. And so we give you praise just for the blessing of having had Edna in our lives one way or the other and to tell her story and how she loved you as well. We do ask your comfort to be with them. Lord, all her loved ones who are missing her now. And we pray, Lord, that you might help us to live well in her steps as she also sought to follow you. Lord, we lift you those who need your t touch of healing. For Gary Innes, for he healing from the hip pain and ability, that you'd be with Lillian that you'd be with Pete Kavicki, that you'd be with Carl as he fights cancer. We ask, Lord, that your comfort would be with the family also of Norma Svedine, uh, laid to rest uh, this week. Lord, there's a young man named Ryan who needs your help with the challenges he faces. And we thank you also, Lord, for the opportunity to stand for justice and mercy as we seek your ways to overcome evil in the beautiful country of Ukraine. We pray for an end to tyranny. We pray for an end to aggression. We ask for you to beat all the swords into plowshares and allow the refugee to return to a home and that we might be found able to help the rebuild as well. Lord, bring to naught the counsel of the wicked, we ask. And Lord, we thank you that in you we have the strength to face the challenges that are represented in each life of each person within the sound of my voice. And we pray, Lord, that you would comfort and assure and guide and revive each one. And for struggling souls who have not found their way home to you yet, Lord, would you open the eyes, open the heart, and help us to be faithful witnesses, in deed certainly, but also in word, that with gladness and with integrity, we can tell your story. We honor you and thank you and pray together as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but, but deliver, deliver us from evil. evil. For, For thine is the, the kingdom, kingdom and the power and, power and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Maybe seated. The uh, as we make our offerings, you know we have baskets in the back. Folk are using the uh, QR codes. They're using the donate tab, and 
And Shirley has double duty because she's our collector. So she's the only one who knows what anybody gives. I never do, and I don't want to. But uh, it's an opportunity to respond to God's goodness. God has blessed us. We return a portion to love him and also to participate in his work. And now let us dedicate it to him in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your generosity to us. We thank you for the gift of life that we can be here this morning. And we do pray that you give us strength. We pray, Lord, that you would build this body of believers stronger, stronger, that our offering is certainly financial, but even more so our hearts, our hands, our lives, and that we give of ourselves to each other as a way of loving you and to our neighbor as a way of spreading the kingdom. So would you take the gifts that we offer, multiply them for your purposes, and grant us integrity in all that we do. We would ask it in the name and to the honor of Jesus. Amen. Please stand and join in our song of dedication. to welcome Jacob Searfoss playing bass for us for the first time. Verses 11 through 17. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up, and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, so John summoned two of his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. When Mother Teresa died in 1997, the sisters of her order discovered something interesting on the walls of the simple room in which Mother Teresa lived. 
It was a list of sayings. Now it's known often as Mother Teresa's Anyway poem. But it was really written years before by Ken Keith, and he calls it the Paradoxical Commandments. One of them says, give the world the best you have, and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. And another, more germane to today's topic, says, people favor underdogs, but follow only top dogs. Fright, or rather, fight for a few underdogs anyway. We love an underdog once we know they've got a chance. How do I know? I didn't watch the fourth and fifth games of the 2004 ALCS. Some of you know what that means. We, once they don't look like a lost cause, we're interested. But if they look like a lost cause, we drop them like flies. Right? But aren't we all underdogs? Thank the Lord that there are no lost causes in the kingdom of God. As we comb through the Old Testament for the times that Jesus was foreshadowed within its pages... We come to the prophet Elijah. After Jesus himself, Elijah is the greatest miracle worker within the pages of the Bible. And like Jesus, he strategically withdrew from people after times of exhausting ministry. Like Jesus, he spoke boldly to corrupt leaders. Today, however, I want to focus on one particular point in common. It might seem minor, but both Elijah and Jesus raised a widow's only son from the dead. Hmm. This is 1 Kings 17, 8 to 24. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar, and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. The jar of meal will not uh, be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me, have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance? And to cause the death of my son? But he said to her, give me your son. He took him up from her bosom, carried him up to the upper chamber where he was lodging, laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. And then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. So this is the story of, the widow, of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath who saw her only son die. Never ignore the details of the Bible and then try to say, well, it doesn't make sense to me. 
pay attention to the details. Elijah breaks into the Bible scene just a few verses before this. He storms the court of King Ahab of Israel and announces that the God of Israel has announced, has decreed a drought that will last for years. You want to know how timely this is? This isn't cruelty. This is an economic sanction against a crooked ruler. Hmm. Just saying. But we didn't invent those. Ahab, instead of leading God's people God's way, had taken a queen, the notorious Jezebel, from the neighboring land of Sidon and adopted Sidon's twisted religion along with her. So after making his proclamation, suddenly Elijah was no longer welcome in Ahab's kingdom for some reason. Shocker. After withdrawing to the wilderness, God sends Elijah to this widow in Zarephath of Sidon. You might say it's hostile territory. You know, a Yankee fan would be more, more welcome in Kenmore Square than Elijah was in Sidon. And God says, go to a poor woman and live there. The drought has already caused crop failure and famine. And he starts off with a great heaping portion of chutzpah. Daring to ask the woman on the edge of starvation to share her depleting resources with a despised foreigner. Oh, this is going to work, right? But he promises that there will be enough. And there was. A miraculous feeding. Hmm. Extra foreshadowing of Jesus. No extra charge. You have to wonder about Elijah's impact. Just, just from living there. He had a separate room. No hint of scandal. Somehow the woman with no visible means of support had food when all around her were running short. Hmm. Starts to witness to the power of God. And it could be a lesson on tithing, by the way. Give a portion to God. See what he does. When you, tr when what, when you trust what you have to God, he provides. Carol and I can tell you he's done it for us. You know, perhaps the widow is slowly beginning to trust the God whom Elijah proclaims. Perhaps she's beginning to be willing to say King Ahab is wrong. But then the boy, her son, small enough for Elijah to carry upstairs, contracts a deadly illness. And before anything could be done, he dies. The woman takes it as a judgment on her own moral failures. What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my son? Remind me of my sin and kill my son. When you represent God, people may direct anger they have against God against you. Certainly Elijah wondered what God was up to. She sheltered him and this was the thanks she got. But God defends those who speak for him. If he sends you somewhere, he's got your back. And God showed up in that upper room as well. Elijah cried out. He was completely unafraid to show God how he was really feeling. See, something about prayer, it doesn't have to be polite. God has really big shoulders. He can take honesty. He'd rather have an honest relationship with you and your anger than politeness at a distance. However, honesty is two-way. Brace yourself for his answer. Although Elijah was confused, he did what he could. Think about your own life. Although Elijah was confused, he did what he could, what he knew to be right. Some have described Elijah's actions as artificial respiration, as restoring the boy from hypothermia, but he did what he knew and trusted God to do the rest. Whatever it was, God was in it and restored the boy back to his mom. Wednesday night, we were uh, discussing the Bible's words for miracles. And one we translate often as signs. And that's how this woman understands this act. 
The miracle authenticates the message. As Elijah brings him her son, her, her son to him, whatever, you know what I mean. She's <laughs> he brings her the son, yeah. Now I know that you are a man of God. Now I know you're a man of God. And that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Her loyalties are made clear. She knows that God is good, that God's word is true, and that Elijah is God's trustworthy representative. Not a peaceful day, but a good one. It looked hopeless, but God showed him showed his investment in there being no lost causes in the kingdom of God. Shirley read to us the gospel lesson, Luke 7. Just as in the Elijah story, we meet a widowed woman whose only son has died. Only this woman is from Nain. Nain is a small town in Galilee. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, or is this? No, I did. Yeah. <laughs> We're good, right, Frank? <laughs> Ask me later. Just as in the Elijah story, we meet a widow woman whose only son has died. This woman is from Nain, a small town in Galilee. It's the same district then as Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, his home turf. It's not exactly next door. Um, it'd be like Bellingham or Menden or something. And unlike Zarephath, Nain is not hostile territory, but it's the only time it's mentioned in any literature of this purpose, of this period. It's a forgotten little town to everybody else. Little towns are often beautiful, but often forgotten. I, I do draw from a fiddler on the roof a lot, but do you, can you, anybody remember the song at the end when the cast is singing Anna Tevka? They're expelled from the only home they've ever known. I belong in Anna Tevka, tumble down, work a day. Anna Tevka, dear little village, little town of mine. And they have to walk away. We love little towns, but we worry about them being forgotten. You know, after all, a few towns that used to exist are underneath the Quabbin Reservoir. Does God likewise forget? Especially this woman. As with the woman in the Elijah story, we have here another lost retirement plan. It wasn't right that there were very few ways for a woman to make a legitimate living in that place and time but it was the reality. The widow's son that Jesus raised is described in one place as a young man. So he's probably been providing for his mother. All that was gone. And that had to be on her mind as the woman followed the funeral procession to the burial site. Destitution was staring her in the face along with the loss of this loved son. And I like that this is not an instance where there's any other motivation to restore this young man to life other than the compassion of God. And what the people say in response to the miracle is incredibly insightful. They say, God has visited his people. And there's a, a lot behind that word visited. If you're at all familiar with the Episcopal denomination, it's that word, episkopos, actually. Um, it's the root word for bishop. It means supervisor. Literally, literally that God saw from heaven. It calls to mind God's words to Moses at the burning bush. I have seen the distress of my people Israel. From on high, nothing gets past the Lord lies and false information don't matter. They don't fool God. He sees what is going on and takes appropriate action. It's literal supervision. Or if you prefer Yogi Berra, it's amazing what you can observe by looking around. <laughs> <laughs> I 
and it looked hopeless, but there are no lost causes in the kingdom of God. Nain was not forgotten. Neither was this woman, neither are you, any of us. God did what was needed. Now, why was this important? Why this roll call of women whose sons had died? Granted, they're raised from the dead, but why play with a mother's emotions? Well, no one is playing. You see, God saw his only son die. He knows the pain. Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus, though he was about to, about to bring him back. At the crucifixion, the son cried out in pain, both physical but also the emotional loss of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God himself knows the pain. And Jerusalem was supposed to be loyal territory. Not the hostile lands of Sidon, not the boondocks with no cell reception like Nain. This was world city Jerusalem, the original city on a hill. And there's something here that's like Elijah. This is Jesus who had served the Lord. And this is the thanks he got. Shouldn't there be blessings for obedience? Well, now the Gospels tell us that Mary had other sons. So that part of the story is not the same as far as the retirement plan. Even without a destitute mother, there were a whole bunch of people watching the execution whose futures had just been blown up. They had built their lives and their expectations around Jesus. And now he was dead. The believers wondered what God was up to. Having faith means taking a step because it's the right thing to do, not because you can see what's going to happen, but they hardly knew what direction to take the next step. But God followed his pattern, he's true to himself. He was not silent. The miraculous darkness, the earthquake, the curtain torn in two, all creation cried out in pain because the author of creation had been executed by his creatures. Still, God was not inactive. Still, God was on the move. God saw. God cried. He didn't raise his son immediately because there had to be no doubt that he had been truly dead, so that our hope for life beyond the grave could be certain. God has power over death. Those who trust him can count on a life of joy beyond the grave. No lost causes in the kingdom of God. God saw. He saw the depravity of human hearts, but he looked deeper still and saw the crying need for hope. You know, from on high, nothing gets past the Lord. He saw and demonstrated his power. You know, Zarephath and Nain, they were off-Broadway productions. This was the big time. So why does this keep showing up? Why is this topic so important that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament example of God restoring the widow's son to life? I'll ask you a question. Do you have a son who died? The real life loss of a son, literally such a loss, is brutal. It's like you cannot breathe. It might happen by degree. The threat of it hanging over your head for years. Or suddenly out of the blue, your beautiful boy is gone. Sometimes depression has a pretty clear source. But if you'll allow me, I would say that others have a son who's died. What I mean is, is there something else you've pinned your hopes on that's been taken away? Something that got snatched away from you. Perhaps you can't imagine life being good without this thing. But that just makes you an underdog. There are no lost causes where God is king. As it was with Elijah, so it is for you. 
As it was with Jesus, it is with you. God is not silent. God is not inactive. God sees and will visit. He holds true to the pattern. He will see what needs to be done and does it. During our hardest times, it is often not the difficulties happening to us that are the greatest challenges. It is our maintaining our part in the struggle, our keeping going. Think about it. David could have given up when he saw a nine-foot Goliath. Instead, he looked at him and said, what a big forehead. (laughs) He grabbed his sling and his stones and planted one in the billboard between the nose and the hairline. God is at work. We do want underdogs to win, don't we? Underdog people, underdog countries. As you know, it took a lot of time for our country to get on board with taking an active role in defending peace-loving nations from Nazi tyranny during World War II. As he felt the urgency to overcome our isolationism, President Roosevelt took the small country of Norway as his example. He said, if there is anyone who still wonders why this war is being fought, let him look to Norway. If there is anyone who has any delusions that this war could have been averted, let him look to Norway. And if there is anyone who doubts the democratic will to win, again I say, let him look to Norway. A great example of the spirit of Norwegian independent, and I'll murder this, Jan Balsrud. Jan, Jan, it looks like, one, one biographer called him that nation that occupied nation's 12th man. In early 1943, he and three other commandos with a boat crew of eight, all British-backed Norwegian uh, freedom fighters, they embarked from northernmost Scotland on a mission to destroy a German airfield control tower in Norway. A betrayal led to the other 11 being killed. Balsrud escaped into the the snow-covered mountains having lost one of his boots in the struggle. If you've ever wondered if you can believe in underdogs, and if you've ever doubted that there are no lost causes in the kingdom of God, what happened over the next nine weeks remains one of the wildest, most unfathomable survival stories of World War II. Balesreed's feet froze solid. An avalanche buried him up to his neck, He wandered in a snowstorm for three days. He was entombed alive in snow for another four days and abandoned under open skies for five more. Alone for two more weeks in a cave, he resorted to drastic measures to stop the spread of gangrene in his toes. He spent the last several weeks tied on a stretcher near death as teams of Norwegian villagers dragged him up and down the snowy mountains of Norway transporting him by stretcher toward the border with Finland. He was put in the care of some Laplanders. They pulled him on a reindeer-driven sled across Finland into neutral Sweden, and only then, Belsrud was collected by a Red Cross seaplane and flown to a hospital in Sweden. Seven months in a hospital there, flown back to Britain in a tiny plane, and he was soon in Scotland helping to to train Norwegian patriots who were going to enter Norway to continue the fight against the Germans. He could have used today's song. Right now, in the good times and the bad, God is on the throne. Never give up. God does not give up on you. God cares about what you are going through now. He cares about you living forever with him in heaven. Trust him. There are no lost causes in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, for ourselves and for all we know who are fighting what seem to be lost causes or what some are calling lost causes, we pray, Lord, you to give grace and strength and for you to have victory. 
And Lord, I pray that each one hearing this would trust you even when the difficulties come. That the same life-giving power that was at work in Elijah and at work in Jesus is at work in each believer through the Spirit of God. Show us, Lord. Speak to our hearts and lead us that we may walk in your power. For Jesus' sake. Let's close singing, Open My Eyes That I May See. we go as your agents sent on your mission. Guide us and be with us and help us, we ask in Jesus' name.